Benvenuti a tutti. Welcome, everyone. We have a couple special okay. guests today from the Lange, from Piemonte, Vittorio Alessandria, from Fratelli Alessandria. Tori. Ciao. Ciao. And Pier Guido Busso, from Piero Busso in Neve, in the Barbarosco Zone. Ciao, Piero. Ciao. Pier Guido, excuse me. Thank you for joining us today. We have a lot to cover. We have a, a lot of people that have tuned in today, and this, this should be fascinating. So there's all sorts of, of uh, actually, let me, the first question let me ask you is, um, you're in two different spots. So uh, Pier Guido, I'll start with you and then Vittori, if you could answer. But you're out in the vineyards, you have that advantage of, over other people that have had their businesses closed. How is the growing season coming along? How do the vineyards look? It started. Yeah, uh, the season now is uh, is great. We we had uh, uh, the beginning of the season uh, a little bit uh, dry, and uh, fortunately, from uh, April May we, we had uh, a good quantity of water of rain. So now we are in a beautiful uh, vegetation. The the flowering is done. So we already have fruit and uh, yeah, for the moment we are uh, very happy about the, the growing uh, of the season. But does it look to be on schedule or are you ahead of schedule a little bit or? Sorry? I said, it, are, are things on schedule? It was the blooming all on schedule? I talked to some people last month, they said it was a little bit of a head, ahead of time, but this, this, this. Yeah, no, we, mm, at the moment, we have uh, around uh, 10, 50 days in, a, in advance respect to the last year. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear well. That's all right, that's all right. Vittore, how are things looking in your vineyards? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. We are in the same situation uh, as uh, in May, so we, have, uh, we are a bit in advance, but at uh, the moment, we cannot complain about uh, uh, the climate. Maybe we can we can we can complain with some other ca climate situation. Uh, maybe also there in the U.S. But um, maybe the, the the restaurant situation, not the vineyard situation, is our problem at the moment. Well, I'd like to a little bit later on talk about you know selling wine to restaurants and things. But just very briefly, the restaurants are now open again in Italy, right? Yeah, yeah, just opened uh, one week ago. Okay, but it's in a limited fashion, right? Only so many people can go to a restaurant at one time, or? There's a little bit of uh, restrictions, but it's quite acceptable, acceptable. Of course, the restaurant, in average, a restaurant of 60 people at the moment can, uh, can have uh, like 40, so a bit more than half. Uh, percent so uh, it's not bad it's not uh, so it's not as usual okay and i understand that now you can travel between regions I, there was a restriction before you could not travel to a different region but now that's been lifted is that yeah we can travel uh, from the cellar to the vineyards from the vineyards to the cellar very easily <laughs> and we can do that uh, quite often and uh, we have not, in the last few, three months, we haven't had the, uh, the destruction, the positive destruction of uh, the tourists, the, of the wine lovers coming. No. Line. Vittoria, you, you're audio and your video is breaking up a little bit. I don't know if you can change your Wi-Fi network or if not, don't worry about it. But if it's possible, I can talk to Pierre Guido. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm in the best position in the okay. cell. That's fine. Just a few seconds here and there. That's, that's not a big problem. So we'll talk a little bit more later on about what you're going to be doing the next few months in terms of, of dealing with the market and, and how things are going to change. But First, I want to talk about, first, of course, about your wines, your current releases, but I want to, even before that, I want to talk about your work, both currently right now, what you were doing and, and what you did with your father and your grandfather, and 
question, you know, you get the question all the time. People ask me all the time, what's the difference between Barolo and Barbaresco? And of course, it's, you know, you can give a simple answer, but, you know, Pier Guido, you're in Neve, so even there, the wines are going to be different from Treizo or from Barbaresco and Pittori, you're in, in Arduno, so the wines are going to be very different from Sierra Lunga or Monforte. So let me ask both of you, and I'll start Pier Guido with you. Yes. Uh, with, 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 the question is with, with Nebbiolo. I mean, what you've been working so long with Nebbiolo. What what is, has that meant to you in your life? What 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 characteristics? You know, what what why is people so different? You don't see it anywhere else. So basically. Sorry, could, could you repeat? Because I lost the line. I, I asked about you know, Piemonte is the home of Nebbiolo. It's not planted yes. in many other places. And the only great wines, with the exception of one wine from Valtellina, they're all from Piemonte when they're made from Nebbiolo. What, why is that? What, what makes the land, you know, so special? You can talk about the Lange in general, but talk also about, about, uh, about Neve and about Barbaresco and, and what, what characteristics you try and bring out in your wines from Nebbiolo. Yeah. Uh, I have a vineyard in, uh, in Neve and, uh, and in Trezo. So only in the area of the, the Barbaresco. What uh, I could say that the wine from uh, our area, respect to the wines from Barolo, uh, in general, the, the wine from, uh, from Barbaresco. This is my, my village, neighbor. Yes, okay. And um, especially the wine from neighbor are a little bit more uh, approachable, a little bit, uh, more feminine, respect some part uh, of the, the Barolo region. I think the biggest difference comes from more when uh, both the wines, so Barbaresco and Barolo, are more young. So at the beginning, uh, the Barbaresco is normally <coughs> open uh, with uh, a softer tannin, lighter color. And so I could say that this is the, the biggest difference that we can find if we compare the, the two areas. Okay. Vittore, what, tell me about, you know, the work that you've done with Nebbiolo. What, what characteristics are you trying to bring? Your wines are very elegant. I've tried two of your 2016 from Verduno, and Verduno certainly has a special character that is different than, like I said, Ser Lunga or Monforte or Barolo. Tell me a little bit about that and, and about how, how you've changed over the years, what, what you're trying to do now that maybe you weren't doing a few years ago. Okay, the, about um, uh, the soil, of course, we have to, to, go, to go back uh, like eight millions of years ago. So we, um, the, before here in, uh, in Lang, both, both the region, Barol and Barbares were, was an, uh, a sea, and uh, so the, 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 the story, the, the beautiful story of the Lange Hills uh, started there. And uh, so the first uh, uh, most important thing is uh, uh, of the war, of course it's soil, and I can also show you a bit uh, the, the soil of the room is uh, especially, uh, but I don't know if you can, uh, Yes. See, is uh, especially uh, clay, silt, and just a little bit of, uh, of sand. Uh, more or less, also like uh, the Barbaresco region, it depends. Uh, but, but a bit different from uh, Monforte area, where the, the, there the sand is, uh, is much higher in, in quantity. So, this is Verduno, and Verduno is located. In fact, located in the northern part of the Barolo region. And so, uh, this aspect, uh, the, 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 the microclimate aspect, I think it plays an important role in general, but for Verduno to characterize the, the Barolo from Verduno uh, for, for this kind of uh, spicy areas. Uh, because we are the closest village in the Barolo region, like the Barbaresco in the Barbaresco region, the closest, closest to um, Tano River. So the Tano, the river, plays an important role in terms of microclimates, so 
uh, during the temperature shift. So I think this aspect is very important. And then, of course, the Montpellier or some other, some specific vineyards depend also by, uh, by the morphologic uh, situation of, of the hill. So how the hill is, is there are some, some crews, some NGA are uh, more uh, homogeneous or similar to itself. Some others like Busia uh, uh, or Tanubi uh, that are uh, much larger, a little bit less homogeneous, so more different. Uh, also in uh, in the in the vineyards itself. So, but uh, I, I think uh, for Verduno, uh, the most important thing is the microclimate. Uh, so the the, uh, the 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 fact that it's so close to the river and uh, that make uh, Verduno so distinct. So distinct. Okay. And both both of you also work with Nebbiolo in Langen. Tell, tell me about that wine. Langhene Biolo is a wine that in the last uh, 10, uh, 15 years increased uh, a lot uh, his, uh, his, uh, his power in the market because it is uh, uh, it's so, it's so interesting because it is uh, a wine that you can put in a, in a, in a, in a sphere, in, in a place of the, of the sphere where there was a lackness before, you know, because uh, Langene Biolo comes out with also a little bit the increasing of, uh, of, the, of the vineyards, of the Biolo uh, vineyards. So, uh, because at the, at, the, at the beginning, like 20 years ago, there were like uh, only half uh, percent of the, of the production of all. And so all the, all the vineyards were, and all, all the best vineyards were for, for, for Marolo or Barbares. But then we, we improved, so in terms of also the quantity of hectares, so we planted more Nebbiolo. And so we have also some, some vineyards now specifically for Nebbiolo. It's very important. Lange Nebbiolo is something that has to be uh, distinct, something that is not uh, the, the brother. Uh, of Barolo, of Barbaresco, I mean, in our opinion. But it's something so uh, distinctive because uh, you have uh, uh, to start from the vineyards. There, maybe uh, also the, the, the yields per hectare is a bit higher for like the oil is 90, 90 quintals per hectare instead of 80 or less for Barolo and less for the single vineyards for sure. And, uh, and also then uh, the fermentation maturation is a bit short and the aging too. There is no minimum uh, uh, of aging by law, so it's an open appellation. Some producer can age for uh, not no oak at all, and some other producer maybe till one year or more in oak. Uh, in oak. We are in the middle. Uh, again, we try to play our, our uh, game, our wine game, uh, always in, in, the, in the elegant side. And uh, so we don't, uh, for, for any wines, we don't want to characterize uh, them inside the cellar. Everything, the beauty is outside the cellar, and so we try to preserve the, that beauty. I like very much this, this concept, the, the, the power of evoking that can have a wine. So we are lucky. For sure, we, have, we need to be to, to say that we are lucky to to have been born to work that we, are, we were born in, in these beautiful areas. But uh, uh, also for that, we, we need to respect uh, as much as possible. Okay, thank you, Pierre Guido. What, what can you tell us about your Lange Neviolo? And yes, uh, uh, for us, we, mm, we consider our Lange Nebbiolo like our little Barbaresco, just uh, an introduction to, to our crew. Um, we use uh, mostly our youngest vines, so uh, vines with 10, 15 years. Okay. In yard, uh, what we have more sand. So for us, uh, the, the Lange Nebbiolo should be a wine uh, just uh, the interpretation, the, the easy interpretation of our uh, Nebbiolo in our uh, area. 
So as I told um, Victoria, change a bit the vinification. So it's a little bit more uh, softer, less extraction, less aging, in order to have a, a wine that is more uh, easier to drink, more uh, fresh, more fruity. Um, but what uh, we want to maintain is the own character of the, of the Nebbiolo. So wine with also soft tannin, but present tannin. Uh, so we don't produce a, a basic Barbaresco and our Lange Nebbiolo is uh, for us our basic Barbaresco. Okay, that's a good explanation. And do you age it in, in oak or you just age it in steel? Yes, we, um, we ferment in a steel tank and then we age it for 12 months in large barrel. Okay, that. and the current vintage on the Lange Nebbiolo is 2018 or 19? Now we have uh, on the market the 2018. Okay, all right. The 19 will be released uh, in, in September 21. Okay, uh, two other wines before we get to Barolo, but first would be Dolcetto. And uh, Pierre Guido, I've not tried yours. I look forward to it. But Vittore, I tried your 2018 Dolcetto d'Alba a few weeks ago. And I have to tell you that I just love Dolcetto anyway. So and I hadn't had yours. And it was one of those evenings, I'd done a lot of work, I was tired, and I was, had been trying a lot of Barolos lately, and I thought, I just, I don't want a Barolo tonight, I want something a little bit lighter. And so I tried your 2018, and I have to tell you that it was, here's the bottle here, which I still have. There we go. But absolutely sensational, and I'm sure some of that had to do with the fact that it was a 2018 vintage, but also just the, the quality fruit you have, the work you did, I mean, it was just, to me, it was textbook dolcetto in the sense that it was just so enjoyable. It was so round. It was so elegant. It brought so much pleasure. And sometimes I think all of us, whether we're in the wine industry or not, we lose sight of that, that wine is supposed to be, offer a lot of pleasure and be delicious. And we shouldn't have to think about every wine we have. So I just, I wanted to compliment you on that wine. And if you could just give me some thoughts on that particular wine and just, you know, let, let people know about the Dolcetto. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we, I completely agree. So our, uh, our goal is that, so to, to try to, uh, to produce a wine very drinkable, enjoyable. No? Usually, sometimes we can, usually we say that Dolcetto is the everyday wine, it's maybe the Monday wine, but in any case, we can say that we, we have to say that it should be a wine uh, very fruity, very beautiful nose. Uh, one of the wine most more difficult to produce. So it's not so easy because uh, you have to pay a lot of attention. You need to uh, to take care because it needs some oxygen, so a lot of uh, racking. But uh, in the meantime, you don't have to exaggerate, uh, and so. Uh, but when uh, you have uh, the right uh, compromise and you can uh, keep it very open, I think uh, in terms of nose is one of the, the most interesting wines. And then, of course, in the mouth is a, has uh, some uh, good uh, tannins, not too much, with uh, this kind of almond aftertaste is uh, the trademark of the chip. Maybe it's not it's the, the best name for a wine, for a red wine. Uh, with, uh, almond, right, with, uh, with uh, yeah, that is, okay, uh, don't you being sweet, I'm, I'm sure that scares a lot of people away, but it's just, and the few that I've had from 2019, other producers, it seems like it's two great vintages back to back for Dolcetto, so I, I, hopefully that'll increase sales, so. I, I cannot see any other reason, uh, at least for, for Dolcetto Dama, that is not the name, or, uh, the fact that sometimes you have uh, not so, uh, a maybe some, produce, some producers start to create uh, uh, too strong dolcetto or something else that want to uh, be more similar to another one. Uh, except for these two reasons, uh, I, don't, uh, I, I cannot uh, see any others. Uh, about the fact that in the market it has not so great success at this point. Then, of course, it's uh, like a, a wave, a trend, so it's right. not right. in, in, in the best trend at the moment. Well, I, I agree with your, 
your statement about, you know, maybe some producers try and make, you know, what we call, quote unquote, a serious dolcetto. And it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It, I mean, you should just make what you, what you have, what, what the grapes give you. And it, there's nothing wrong with a wine that you can drink right now or you can drink in two or three years, but it's not going to last for 20 years. There's no question about that, like Barolo. But it just, it just is so delicious and works with so many different foods that uh, I just, I was so glad to taste that wine because I just, it was so classic, the Dolcetto. So again, thank you. So let's talk about Barbera. And I want to bring that up because your importer in the United States, North Berkeley Imports, Billy Weiss sent me an email and he said that he is selling a lot of Barbera lately. And he, he just was, he was surprised, a little bit surprised by that. Very pleasantly surprised, very happy. But he asked me why I thought, you know, Barbera was selling so much and I gave him an answer. But I think it's better if, if we hear from you as, as to your Barbera and, and what you think are the most positive thing. Pierre Guido, please tell us yes. about about, about Barbera? Yeah, we produce uh, two Barbera. We have the Barbera Mariano uh, that has come from uh, Neve, that uh, is in the same plots of vineyard of the Langenebbiolo. And um, in this part of the vineyard, as I told before, is more rich of sand, so it's more fruity Barbera, and more, uh, more light, uh, um, so more... Uh, more fruity Barbera. The vinification for both the Barbera are completely the same. Okay. So we, yeah, this was one of my decisions to, to bring the both Barbera vinificated and aged in the same way. The San Stefanetto, the other Barbera is from Treso, where we have uh, the San Stefanetto crew. So we are in a completely different terroir. So, more rich of clay and uh, very compact sand. So it's very, um, it's much more complex, more rich. Uh, uh, I love Barbera because uh, especially in the last vintages where uh, we have uh, a bit of problem with the, the sun, the Barbera can always maintain a, a beautiful freshness. So it's a wine that uh, I really appreciate and uh, it's one of the, the variety that I drink very often. Great. Vittore, tell us about your Barbera. Yeah, we, we produce two Barbera too. So, but one is a classic Barbera and the other is a Barbera d'Alba Superiore. Exactly. The Barbera d'Alba Superiore Priora. Priora is the name of this one. Superiore means, as a specific meaning by law, means uh, an, uh, a minimum of oak aging of one year. So in general, the Barbera d'Alba Superiore are a selection of vineyards. And also for us, is a specific selection of two vineyards, one from Barbuno, one from Forte d'Alba. And the name Priora means the first is a nickname because I couldn't, we couldn't uh, give the name of the vineyard because there's more than one vineyard there. And so the Priora means our best, our selection, our superior. The classy Barbera usually has to be fruitier, easier, like a jet, like a, an everyday wine uh, to be drunk in two, three years maximum. The Barbera Superiore can last, can last for uh, some years too because uh, uh, is a selection very deep. In general, the best Barbera Superior in the eye are in the warm, warm vintage. Uh, so sometimes like 2003, 7, and 11, right? the vintages that were sometimes too too warm, too hot for Nebbiolo. Uh, those vineyards, vintages usually are very beautiful Barbera Superior. Even if you reach a very high percentage of alcohol, the Barbera maintains a good uh, acidity. So the, we have to say that always is uh, in a wine, it's not a, a, waste, a matter of quantity, it's a matter of um, relationship, of, uh, of uh, ratio. So the ratio the, the between uh, uh, alcohol, acidity, structure, uh, uh, polyphenols, uh, these aspects together uh, can give uh, elegance of, uh, of balance to a moment, not only one specific element. Okay, we have one comment here from a, one of the registrants, and, and it's Farouk Chabi. 
I pronounced that right. He says, if people are drinking Barbera, it's because it's versatile and affordable. And he says, for him, it's a wine of all purposes. So it's probably a good way to put it. One more wine, and dear Guida, I know you don't produce it because it's not planted in your, your town, but your commune, excuse me, but Vittore. Since you're in Verduno, you make a lovely wine called Pella Verga, which is really only found in Verduno. Tell us a little bit about the history of that and about the wine and, and how you make it. Pella Verga, the Verduno Pella Verga, that we call, uh, the, called Spezia. There it is. Thank you. The, the, <laughs> you got the right one. Me too, yeah. Bravo. So the producer have to work together. Then me and Pier Guido, we work also with our Berkeley and it's always a, a, a matter of relationship. We need a good, a good importers to reach in a good way the customers, even, even without the help of the good uh, importers, the good uh, uh, distributors, uh, our, our job sometimes can, can be lost a bit, at least uh, before to reach the customers, the last customers in uh, Los Angeles uh, or Santa Barbara. But uh, the Bella Verga is, 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 the, the, is the gate to enter, to understand Verduno Giurito, uh, the Verduno village, because it's one of the most spicy peppery wines we have in Italy. And uh, this is due to the Pella Verga, uh, that is an indigenous variety, to the variety itself, but is also due uh, to the terroir, to the soil, but uh, again, the microclimate that plays a so important role. So, starting from the Pella Verga, that is a local variety, we only have in Verduno, we just are 15 producers, uh, less than 150,000 uh, bottles in total production. Okay. We produce a bit more than 20,000 bottles. So we believe a lot in, the, in this wine. And uh, uh, is, uh, is a wine to understand the, how Verduni is distinct, uh, is, is uh, different, no? Because only Verduno, this kind of uh, varietal, uh, found historically in, in some years, some uh, century ago, is its ideal habitat. Uh, only there it could show all these uh, spices. And so I think uh, the trade union, uh, the fil rouge for all the ones of Verduno, is this kind of spicy habitat. Not only the Verduno Verga, where the, this spiciness is at, at the maximum point, but also in the, in the Barons, in the Barbera, uh, till uh, like the Biore, so in all the wines, it's, uh, it's, a, a bit, it's a peculiarity. And this is also why, one of the reasons why Fratelli Alessandria, that is a, a winery start that was born in 1830 with another name and then after two generations, she's named, but Always we try, we try to produce wine in uh, the same uh, way, that is the way of respect, uh, the, the elegance and the beauty uh, of, uh, of terroir, because terroir is so important that we can demonstrate, uh, for, especially with the, with the Barolos, but also with the, with the other wines. Okay. It, it, if, uh... Everyone who's watching, you know, gets on a plane in four or five months and comes and goes to Verduno and wants to have Pella Verga with, with their lunch or with dinner, what would you recommend that they uh, pair, what foods should they pair it with? Pella Verga is so interesting and uh, it's, so, it's, it's so modern because it is very, very, very versatile. So you can match with everything, starting with the finger foods, with uh, some appetizers, salumi, salumi is, is beauty, but also with some kind of fish, maybe a bit chilled in the summer, or uh, some, some pasta. But the best match for the verga, for the little Bavaria, like, in my opinion, the best match for all, most of the wines, is the common. The Pella Verga and, uh, and these beauty wines, beautiful wines, 
are to uh, something to share something to share and uh, uh, and so is something not to drink only with the nose or with the mouth but also a bit with the mind with the, with the head but because uh, again with the power of evoking you can, you can start to remember maybe a trip uh, if you already be uh, was in, in the area or maybe you can start to imagine uh, uh, a future travel in uh, in this uh, in this area okay. so i think that the company is a perfect match right we have a lot, a lot of wonderful comments from the people that are watching today and um, several people are saying how much they love it uh, my friend bill goldstein here says he loved Pella verga our friend allison says it's the best and then your important yeah. advice says that Bella Verga is so good that Uso drinks it. So, that, <laughs> so there you go. So let's move on to your your feature wines. And Pierre Guido, let's talk about your Barbaresco. We'll start with Albasani. I'll put up a photo here. You can tell us about yeah. that particular Barolo, or Barbaresco, excuse me, there you are. And it's Albasani Vigna Borghese, you see? So tell yeah. us about, about that vineyard and about how you make the wine and no, the, the um, Albizani is our um, historical vineyard. It was the vineyard that was uh, bought and planted by my grandfather in 1948, and uh, where everything uh, started. Um, my father is called Vigna Borgese, so it's a parcel inside of the Albizani crew, um, because the Borgese is and was the original old name of uh, our house. Um, we have uh, one hectare here, so it's uh, quite small. In, um, in Albesani, we produce the um, two wines, the Albesani Vigna Borgese, and from 2010, I produce also a, a Reserva that okay. uh, was my first wine that I produced, that is called Viti Vecchia. The wines from, uh, from the Albesani are uh, really elegant, really intense, uh, deep, um, not never heavy, but uh, wine that uh, respect the wines from, uh, for example, Mondino, they need a little bit more time because uh, the tannins are always a little bit uh, austere. So it's uh, one of the characteristics of, uh, of the Alvesani vineyards. Okay, and you have three other separate bottlings of Barbaresco, see? Yes, uh, we have the Barbaresco Mondino that is come from the okay, um, uh, MGA crew and the Lina. So the, um, the Barbaresco Mondino is the exactly the hill behind of the Albezani. It's a little bit uh, lower in altitude, a little bit uh, more close. And here we have a little bit more sand. So the Barbaresco Mondino is our uh, more approachable Barbaresco with a softer tannin, very um, floral aroma. It's a bit more easier Barbaresco. And the Gallina is just the hill in front of um, Albesani. The Gallina, I could say that uh, is our Barbaresco with uh, more harmony between uh, the, the structure and powerful and uh, the pure finesse and the, the elegance of the wine from Neve. Okay. Uh, with the Galena, do you still age that in Barik? No, no, no. The, from 2010, all the, okay. our Barbaresco are aged all in large barrel. All, all in Grandi Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. The, the Galena, mm, was aged more in a, a small barrel also because uh, before the 2010 we had uh, only 3,000 uh, and a half meters so it was uh, <laughs> necessary to use a small barrel for the aging. Okay and again the emphasis on sand in, in the soils of some of those vineyards with sand you're going to get a little more floral aromatics correct and the tannins are not going to be so firm? Yes, and uh, in Albizani, for example, we have more silt, more uh, plain and limestone, so the soil is a bit more complex. Uh, the tan is always 
very elegant and soft, but need a bit of, uh, more time. Okay. I have a, a comment here I missed from Ulrika, a friend from Sweden, who says she's drinking the fellow there I got right now. Uh, so, and she says it's cool. delicious. So, and then our friend Allison uh, comments that Pierre Guido's wines evoke the lift and verb from the varieties as Vittori discovers and with they have respect to their specific land. So, uh, Vittori, let's talk about your Barbaresco. I'm sorry, first of all, last question for you, Pierre Guido. The, the current vintage on the Barbaresco, uh, 2017 or? No, now we, we are on the market with a 16. 16. Because all our Barbaresco are aged for um, two years in barrel and uh, we release after the four years. So okay. the 17 are still um, in the tank now. Okay. We will be battling at the end of the August and we will, uh, we will release in uh, 2021. All right. Can you tell us briefly the difference on the last three vintages between 2016, 2017, and then 2018? How, yes. How, how does the vintages compare? 16 uh, was a, a great vintage that uh, oh, everybody knows. was a, um, a consider a complete vintage because um, the wine also that we take now are rich, um, complex. Uh, um, I consider the, the 16 a modern classic vintage because uh, uh, in terms of uh, Harvest, we pick the grapes in, uh, also in Barbaresco in the second uh, week of um, October. So we had a perfect ripening uh, of the polyphenolic uh, seeds, tannin, uh, was everything's perfect. And, um, but now the sixteen is also a vintage that um, you can drink because the tannin are, uh, are really soft and sweet. So the, the 16 uh, for sure is a vintage that's possible to, to age for a long, long time, but uh, is also a vintage that is possible to drink now. Yeah. Uh, so 17 uh, was a little bit more difficult because it was uh, very warm and dry. And also, unfortunately, we had um, some problem from storm hail. So it was uh, not an easy vintage. Um, we picked uh, a bit early, so and was fortunately a, a good idea because uh, we we picked the grape with a, a good pH and good acidity. Okay. So the wine uh, now are uh, are very interesting. So in the Barbaresco, I tasted also some other Barbaresco from friends, and uh, and the quality is is, is good. 18 uh, is very interesting too. Mm, it was not easy because also in 18 we had a lot of rain in, uh, in May, so in the spring. And fortunately, the second part of the, the summer was perfect. So also in 18 we picked uh, almost uh, in the middle of October. But um, it's different from the 16 uh, uh, because it's less classic for sure, as a little bit more uh, concentrated, okay. but a beautiful uh, tannin already. I already, I still have the 18 in the, in the barrel, but uh, when, I, when I tasted, I feel the tannin that's uh, very sweet. Uh, so gonna be a very interesting touch. Great, great, thank you. Vittori, let's talk about the Barolo, and uh, I know the current vintage is 2016, which is, I agree with Pierre Guido, the really classic vintage, I've had so many lovely wines, and um, I know you also make one from Monforte from the MGA Gramolere, but let's talk about your two, get you back up there, thank you, let's talk about the two from uh, Verduno, the San Lorenzo di Verduno and the Monbiliero which is the more famous, but talk about both of those wines for 16. Yeah, we have uh, out with uh, 16 and we are lucky about that. So we probably will, we will be able to, uh, to uh, pass this difficult uh, uh, period. Also thanks to the great interests and uh, 
the, the, the market has for, for this vintage. Uh, 16, we, uh, San Lorenzo, Momigliero, the two vineyards we have uh, in Verdun, but also the Gran Mere from Monforte, we uh, do uh, all the three single vineyards exactly in the same way. Three years of uh, big oak uh, barrels, and before a quite long fermentation maturation in the skin for about three weeks, four weeks. So again, we try to be very coherent uh, on all the, the, these passages because, uh, uh, of course, if you say that uh, the terroir is important, uh, of course, we cannot do the barolos. Uh, in my opinion, in, in a different way. Otherwise, I, I should uh, talk about the difference uh, in uh, winemaking. And I want to talk about that because I think it is less interesting. For sure, you have to improve your winemaking during the years, and we had a lot of time to do that, to, to go uh, behind, but everything has to be in favor or to, to go uh, to adapt ourselves, our job, to a specific site, to a specific uh, uh, terroir, uh, etc. So, uh, San Lorenzo and, and uh, Mobiliero. Mobiliero is the most important single vineyards in Verdun. Yes. One of the most historic, and also uh, in the last 10 years, also uh, became again. Uh, one of the most important uh, single vineyards in the Ballon de Ligio. Yes. And uh, uh, now we, there are uh, around 15 producers doing Mobilier. We were the first, and the first vintage uh, was the 78. I tried, which is small Okay. to show. So this is uh, 78 and uh, is the same, same label as today. Okay. So, why the same label? It's not uh, actually it's the San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo. Lorenzo, but they see the label. So, yeah, and the San Lorenzo, the same, uh, uh, always the same label. So, Barolo is the most important thing in the label and in our opinion in the winemaking. San Lorenzo, the Montmigliero, as at least as important as Fratelli del Santo. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the reason why we didn't uh, change this label and we will never change probably because it shows very well how the elegance in the classic style is important for us. Uh, San Lorenzo and Montmigliero are, are quite close, both in Verduno, uh, but uh, the Macu Climate, I think, is the most important uh, difference. Uh, with Monforte, uh, instead, uh, Monforte is the south, the opposite part of the Barolo region yes. versus Verduno, because uh, is the, the, the southeast, and there uh, also the soil changes a bit. There is more sand, a bit more sand than limestone soil, and I can show how Verduno and Monforte are down uh, a few meters below. This is Monforte. This is sandstone. Okay. And so you can see also in the Alta Langa when you can see some houses uh, also uh, built with this kind of sandstone that is sand with uh, uh, culture. And in Verduno, Verduno, you know, the name of, uh, is in English is green one. So. Uh, okay evoke the, the, the green, but below, three, four meters below, is blue. I don't know if you can see. Yes. This is the, this is the blue marl. This is a, a limestone. Okay. So these are... And then Montfort is, again, is a bit higher in elevation. It's more than 400 meters above this level. Uh, and Verdun is a little bit uh, lower uh, in elevation. The, 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 exposure for all the three uh, single vineyards is the same south, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the most important difference is uh, the, the microclimate and, and the soil. 
etc. But again, I want just to say that maybe also there are some young guys or someone that uh, is seeing us and uh, maybe think about Barolo like something uh, a bit expensive, etc., or difficult to, to drink. Now it's not more, uh, it's no more like, like uh, 20, 30 years ago. The, the tennis usually are much more juicy. It's because, uh, because of the vineyards. We pay much more attention than 20, 30 years ago to the vineyards, so the ripeness of the tennis is much higher. But I also have to suggest to these people that a good way to enter, to understand, to approach, and to, to see the, the, the biolo, the, the Lange in general, is with the Lange and Biolo. Lange and Biolo is the great wine also to enter, to the first step to trying to uh, get in love with this. With the art, with the Nebbiolo itself, because all the beauty of, the, of all the elegance you can already uh, understand there, but with much easier techniques. And I, we, I, we should emphasize to everyone that again, your winemaking is very traditional with Barolo, all grandi botte, all large, large, large barrels, which I prefer. I, I think that whether, whether it's Barolo or someone in Tuscany or wherever. I think it, it just shows off the varietal flavors, the, the characteristics of the grape much better. And you don't you get so little influence from wood. So at, at one note on the 16s, I tried your two from Verduno, the Mobiliero and the San Lorenzo di Verduno. And as you mentioned, San uh, Mobiliero is so famous. It's sort of the grand cru of Verduno. But I was in, in remarkably impressed by the San Lorenzo as to how elegant it was and that wine especially, but both of them, with the 16 vintage, I would describe as being very much Burgundian. And, and I, I, I thought that was, that just added to its appeal for me. Wines are so beautiful, but they just, that little Burgundian quality to them. Do you agree with that? Tom, yeah, absolutely. Tom, I also want to say that tradition can be contemporary and has to be contemporary. And we, uh, me, Pierre, that we are not so young, but still uh, quite, uh, still young enough, we want to maybe to be this one uh, more uh, contemporary, you know? And I think the best thing, the most important thing at the moment, in this period, is, uh, is not the specific style, traditional or modern, or, uh, uh, what you want, but in my opinion, the most important thing is that you cannot easily recognize the style in the wine. But we hope uh, you, Tom, that you are so passionate, but also some other wine lovers in the US, like in other parts of the world, can maybe one, one time tasting our wines, maybe in a blind tasting, recognize Verduno. Recognize the Momigliero and say, what a beautiful Momigliero, not say, maybe this should be Fratelli Alessandro. We are not the most important, the most interesting thing in this bottle. The most and unique thing, the, the, the thing that is not replicable, is not, uh, you cannot do uh, the same in uh, some other parts in the world. Just because it's something that it was born eight million uh, years ago, right. and it's the specific climate, they say that is the vineyard, the wine, the, 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 this aspect. So, uh, not a specific style of production. So, we, we don't want to be recognized by a specific uh, of aging, a specific technique of maturation just because we don't think uh, it's the most beauty thing in our life. Okay, very good. We have about 10 minutes left and I have two very important questions, a little different than usual, but you're both from the Longay, one from Barbaresco, one from Barolo Zone. Are there wines from other places in Italy or are there other places around the world that you enjoy and then maybe you, you, do they inspire you to, to make better wines? Here Guido. Yeah. Uh, um, now I'm drinking champagne. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, this one. Which one? Emmanuel Brochet. He's a small producer. 
You see the label? What is the name again? I'm sorry. Emmanuel Brochet. Oh, okay. yes, I know that. Okay, excellent. So, um, for me, uh, the France is a, is a, is a I, I go often in, um, in Burgundy, for example. So, Burgundy for me is a good uh, way to inspiration. Um, because I love the Pinot Noir. After the Nebbiolo, my second uh, favorite uh, variety is uh, the Pinot Noir. But also, um, I like a lot the area of the um, Cote Roti, the Raw. Cote Roti, okay. Yeah. And the two areas that uh, inspire me a lot. Burgundy more for the elegance and the, the precision of the wine. And Rhone also because uh, wine very rich, uh, very intense, but never heavy. They have always a soft weight that uh, I love uh, into the wine. And um, yes, there are the two hours that I, I follow and uh, I, I like very much. Interesting. Well, with, between Champagne and then Burgundy and then, and then Cote Roti and the Rhone, I mean, you have not only excellent taste, you have expensive yeah. taste as well, but but as long as you can afford it, that's great. But if, if those those are great models to, to base your wines on. So, Itore, how about you? What, what wines so, I expected uh, Pierre uh, 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 said something in France, so I, I stay in Italy. Okay. And uh, I, uh, uh, I talk about a, a place that is beautiful, a beautiful place with a very high power of evoking. So, like a bit like Lange in a certain way, and this place is Etna. Etna Rosso. Uh, this is Girolamo Russo. I like San Lorenzo, it's also the name of the wine. It's like a bus and flowers. I like so much when you can understand our set and, uh, for example, with Etna and with the elegance. And there, for example, there is this kind of uh, uh, ash, sometimes ash aroma is that evokes the vulcan itself, so that the, the smoke uh, or the kind of soil, and uh, again, is still uh, very elegant and made with indigenous river. So, um, I like the, the, to discover. Uh, I think the curiosity is the first uh, uh, quality of, uh, of a wine drinker, and so to understand and to try to also to discover some new, new uh, places, some beautiful uh, locations. So it's not a new place in the Etna, but in any case. But, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a great answer. I, I love those wines as well. And there's a lot going on. You a lot of small producers and a lot of ideas. And, and um, you know, but sometimes when you don't have that long history, you get a lot of people that just do things, you know, because they like it. And they're not worried about scores or press. and, and you get some great wines that way. So that's, that's great. Uh, one other important question we have to address, you talked about the market before a little bit, Vittore, but with, you know, with the situation we're in with the coronavirus, we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, but I know it's still gonna be a problem for several months, maybe for the rest of the year, maybe even beyond that. But for both of you, what, what have, how has this changed in terms of sales? And how has this changed in terms of marketing what have you learned? What What are you going to do over the next three to six months? To uh, you know, to in in terms uh, in terms of marketing, it's changed. Uh, now we are making a webinar. Okay, that, that's true. <laughs> Did that happen? Did that happen? Too, so yeah. this is a new possibility. And <laughs> thanks again also to Norberti that uh, or the people, uh, the importer that understand. Uh, uh, this importance and help us because uh, I think maybe in the future, me, Pierre, and the other small producers, that uh, we cannot do uh, everything. But uh, in this moment, that we cannot uh, travel anymore. I didn't travel so, so often, but uh, now it's very important to, to maintain like a link, and, uh, and also this technology can be very important for us. So in terms of marketing, help uh, the importers, the distributors, uh, giving some uh, materials, some pictures, everything they need. And of course, our, our passion is, is remain, remain the same. 
uh, I think that today we will, we are, and we will see the job of the last uh, few years, the last few years. I'm uh, quite uh, excited and quite uh, um, optimistic because I'm uh, quite happy about our uh, importers uh, of uh, we for our, our happy about the distributors, the sell agents. They are so important for us because now that we are we cannot uh, reach the, the customers, uh, but in general always they are so important to maintain this chain, to close the, in the right way this chain and try to uh, to to promote to to. Uh, to speak about this value, the value of uh, the territory, the value, the beauty of, uh, of the landscape, uh, the, the, the beauty of the elegance, the viola, the language viola, all the, the indigenous great varieties, etc. But uh, they are so important also to help uh, in a certain way uh, the restaurants that uh, for sure at the moment, in my opinion, is the the more weak uh, is the weak uh, uh, ring of, of the chain, for uh, and uh, and that will continue for for a few months. Okay, here Guido, how about, how about your marketing? What, what have, in terms of sales? Yes. Are, are you are your export markets? Are they still strong? Have they been supporting you? Yeah, um, I'm totally agree with uh, what uh, Victoria told. We will. Uh, have to work more uh, together. We have to support each other. Uh, I still don't know uh, what will happen next week, uh, next month, uh, especially here in Italy, that is our market. But uh, what I've seen uh, in the last uh, days, uh, that uh, there is a lot of optimism that uh, I think uh, will be the most important things to, to rebuild again uh, the what we had before. And with, um, you know, without, with the situation is people can't visit the winery and, and it's, it's, it's- Yes, uh, I already had, um, sorry. Rego. No, I already had some uh, visitors in uh, the last days. Uh, yes, we, we will have to, to start to change something. Uh, especially the visit, we we think about more uh, to do more tour in the vineyard. Maybe also some uh, wine tests in the vineyard that the people will appreciate a lot. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we will have to, um, to to do something new. And in the United States, I read all sorts of stories that you know that because people can't visit wineries and because they're limited as to what they can do. You know, retail stores are open, so people are buying a lot of wine. I mean, they have nothing to do, they can't go out to a restaurant, so they're buying a lot of wine and enjoying it at home. And of course, most of that is medium priced wine. So will you have more of an emphasis, do you think, in the next few months on Dolcetto and Barbera, or will that not change? Uh... Yes, I think that uh, maybe um, the, the Langenebiolo, for example, the, is the, is a, could be one of the wines that uh, should be more easy to, to drink uh, for many reasons, because it's a wine that you can enjoy more easily, you can drink uh, uh, every day. With, uh, without uh, specific events. Uh, and yes, I think uh, the Barbaresco or Parolo um, also, because uh, for example, talking about Europe, I have a um, few distributors that works uh, with a lot of uh, private customer. And uh, during the lockdown, they, they sold a lot of uh, Barbaresco and, and Barolo. Okay, Vittorio, will, will you change your emphasis or make less Barolo or, or, or try and promote, uh, you know, Bella Verga and Dolcetto more often? How, how will that? How will you work? You know, Tom, this is a, a 
very exceptional uh, year, but it's, uh, yeah, we are lucky about it. We also have an exceptional vintage in 2016. So I don't uh, see any problem about Barolo for this year. But for sure, the Pela Verga, Pela Verga is going very well. So it's always in the last few years. And I think these kind of wines, as Pierre Guido also said, Langene Biolo too, uh, this kind of wine that is uh, uh, that has a very beautiful uh, value quality price point uh, and so are very interesting uh, elegant complex but at the meantime are, are approachable and uh, with a good uh, price uh, they can uh, benefit a bit dolcetto yes i hope that we work that I hope also the words you say we need uh, someone uh, helping us uh, the, the importers uh, the first but also some ambassadors, some ambassadors and uh, some uh, reviewers also talking about that because sometimes is uh, is um, is not enough the price or the price point the value to reach the uh, the customers that uh, need to be. Uh, uh, to, to have the curiosity to test the bad one you know, for yeah. some reason. No, no problem for Pella Verga. Eh? It's the only thing it can be for Dolce, but uh, I think uh, can go also that one. Well, I'm actually working on an article on Dolcetto, which I'll have up next month, and you'll, you'll see that I, as I mentioned before, love the 2008. Good. Hopefully that helps. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But this was great. I, both of you were so honest with your answers, and you know, you seem you seem very curious about you know all trying different things, and and you don't know everything. You're learning all the time, so I, I, I appreciate that attitude. It's what do you want to say? You know, Tom, it's very important also the dolcetto, but also some other uh, great varieties like that. It's, uh, that in this breed is not so easy to 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 sell, but it's very important because we don't want to keep out the vineyards. Some producer also, there is this kind of trend that you keep out the dolcetto and you put the Nebbiolo, etc. But uh, in Italy, uh, as you well know, is the, the most, uh, the, 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 the country where we have uh, most of the, of the grape varieties. We don't mm -hmm. need to lose the power and the, the presence of uh, those varieties because uh, the diversity is the beauty, you know? so we uh, we need to keep that. And so uh, wait a bit the market, uh, uh, hoping that some uh, some good uh, uh, ambassadors and reviewers helping us when there is some kind of uh, difficulty. Great. We unfortunately we're out of time. I wish we had another an hour, but this has been great. I appreciate. It. Grazie per l'opportunità. Buon lavoro a voi. Fingers crossed for a wonderful 2020 growing season. So thank you again. Thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Ciao, ciao. We start again. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. ciao.